because I want other people to look at me and say, wow, he's free being himself with his locks. And as you can see, I can be free being my locks with my locks. You know, I can um, still be this huge professional, you know, within my own, um, within my own way and still be me. You know, and that includes, you know, with the tattoos too. Now granted, I don't have any tattoos on my face and neck and, you know, hands, but um, I feel like it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to be us. You know, we can do it our way too. We don't have to conform and do it anybody else's way. And as long as- oh, Family, I'm Dr. Dale, the author of How to Raise a Delta Wizard from Parents Who Did It, author of Black Men Who I Coast, author of the Dr. Doc Children series, author of Pre-Med Mondays, and author of this new bad boy. Check it out if you're watching on the video, look at the screen. It's my newest book coming out. It's called A Doctor's Guide to Self-Publishing. I've already given out a whole bunch of these for free. Um, check the description below. You can figure out where you can get a copy of this book, but I'm teaching doctors and med students. We got a med student on today. Doctors and med students how to write, publish, and uh, you know turn their stories into books that impact people's lives. It's called A Doctor's Guide to Self-Publishing. And you listen to the Black Men and White Coast podcast, a place where Black clinicians have the platform to share their stories with listeners like you. Super excited about today's guest. But before I introduce them, I'm going to remind you all, if you still have not seen the Black Men and White Coast documentary, what are you doing? Go check it out, bmwcmovie.com. Man, it's been screened over 1,200 times, over 1,000 five-star reviews. It's been all over the media, all sorts of stuff. Majority of the med schools have watched it. Go check it out, bmwcmovie.com. And with that said, super excited to get into today's interview. Um, you know, I was kind of uh, watching this guy out, checking him out on, on Instagram and seeing all his posts and stuff, but he was, he's, he's been killing it lately, man. He has been killing it. So we reached out, we said, I got to get this guy on this podcast. I've got to get him on the podcast. Um, he's different, just different, right? And I'm not going to tell you why. You're going to find out from this interview here, but he is different. He's doing his thing right now. He is my guy, future doctor, student doctor, whatever you want. I'm going to say future doctor, Noah Thomas. Super excited to have you on the podcast. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Thank you for having me. It's a blessing to be here. Blessing to be here. I appreciate it. Likewise, blessing, blessing for me to be here. And um. Thank you for accepting and coming on to the podcast. Like I said, I was watching, you know, kind of, you, you know, when, you, when you're on social media, you kind of get a sense, see what's kind of popping, what's going on. And um, you kind of, your stuff just kept on coming up. I was like, man, he's, you know, he's doing his thing out there. He's doing his thing. And I know he's got a story to tell. Um, I looked you up and, and you do have a story to tell. So super excited. First of all, I'm going to say, I always do. I always got to do it. I, I see the Meharry jacket. My wife went to Meharry, so I always got to give props to Meharry. So shout out to Meharry. How are you liking Meharry? I love it, man. It's uh, it's one of a kind, you know. Um, you know, my, I did PWIs on around my first round for my first two degrees. So being able to walk around and see, you know, people that look like me in white coats, whether it be the dentist or the uh, the med students or the dental students, you know, it, it's special, man. It's 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 almost like our, our Wakanda in America. It's it's really cool watching seeing everybody be so successful, so intelligent, so smart. You know, it's it's one of a kind. Yeah, like I always, I always say, I didn't, I didn't graduate from Harry, but I spent so much time there. Um, I probably spent, I probably almost spent a full year there, right? Just between all my breaks and fourth year and stuff like that. I'm a Harry, so I didn't graduate there, but I still got that special feeling just from being there so much, just kind of being with the folks down there, Meharry. Um, So you got a story to tell, and I want to hear your story. Let's take it way, way back to baby Noah, way, way back to baby Noah, right? Um, when you were four, five, six years old, what was your childhood like? What was your childhood like? Were you like balling out in the mansions? Were you living a little more maybe rugged type of lifestyle? What was it like? Uh, so when we were younger, uh, we grew up on Marshall Street, um, literally the um, back of my house, back up to what's called Wolf uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, which is a well-known um, crip area of the of the uh, city. So <laughs> needless to say, it was a uh, it was a little rough, um, but we did have a nice house. You know, um, thankfully, my father provided for us and we had everything we needed. Never skipped a meal, you know, never missed a birthday or anything. But, you know, the area, I believe, really shaped me into who I am today. You know, you see a lot of things growing up in that type of area and, you know, they stick with you. So when you say you see a lot of things, what, what was that? What was one of the worst things you saw as a as a child? Not just saying, that, you know, some some things that I hate sometimes. Um, my brother and I talk about this is we don't want to always paint black people as a monolithic is always everybody being from this and being rough or whatever. But at the same time, you and I were just talking before we started recording. At the same time, people need to know that no matter what your background is, you can make it. So when you say from this rough area, like what were some of the bad things you saw that, that, you know, 
other people might use as reasons why they can't make it, but you're here to say today, hey, I saw these same things, I'm making it. What were some of those things? Uh, I mean, of course, you know, the gang violence with the Crips being, you know, pretty much the predominant uh, gang in that area. Um, but also a um, ton of prostitution, a ton of drug dealing. Um, it, it's pretty much anything that you could, you would expect it to be. Um, you know, people getting killed right around the corner from your house, or even sometimes on a rare occasion, uh, the fights would carry on to our front porch. You know, it'd be middle of the night, you hear a bunch of chairs moving around, getting thrown. You wonder, you know, you think an animal got caught on the porch or something. And you go out there and realize, you know, those two guys fighting it out. And you have to go, you know, handle the situation and try and help people out. But, you know, that's, you're putting yourself kind of in a, uh, a predicament there that you might not necessarily want to be in. But, um, no, man, you see all types of stuff. Um, and I would say to those who are living in a similar situation, um, use that as to, you know, I no longer want to be in this situation, so I'll do whatever it takes to get out of that situation. You know, I don't want to be like this person or that person or, you know, I don't want to be, you know, having fights on the front porch of somebody else's house. You know, I want to make sure that I use this and always remember where I came from and make sure that I never, you know, am able to, to be in that position again. I want to make sure I progress myself to where I can live the type of life that I want to live. Excellent, excellent. That's that's good stuff. That's a, a great message. So don't let your environment dictate where you go in a negative way, but you be in control of that yourself. So how did you stay out of that, right? So I mean, you're in this environment, you got people around you who may or may not be trying to drag you into that environment. Did you have somebody who's, who told you, no, you can't go that route? Or, or did you just, did you look at it yourself and say you didn't want to go that route? Like, what were your influences that let, let you stay out of that? I would say it's kind of a mix of both, um, you know, between myself saying, you know, I don't want to be like that ever. And, um, you know, I was blessed with an amazing mother. She um, took interest to in anything I took interest to. In. So, you know, growing up, you know, I had um, a music side of me where I would play piano, violin, guitar, bass, trumpet, you know, all these different instruments. If I was interested in it, she would facilitate that. If I had my sports side, you know, I want to play basketball, football, baseball, uh, wrestling. If I was interested in that, she facilitated that. I wanted to do art, you know, I wanted to draw, I wanted to do all these different type of things, uh, hunt, fish. And um, she always told me growing up, if you get yourself in trouble, it's because you wanted to get in trouble. It's not because you didn't have an outlet. It's not because you didn't have something that you could do constructive with your time. It's because you chose to make that decision. And so that kind of stuck with me for the rest of my life as, in, you know, you know, geez, what am I doing? I got all these hobbies. I can go fill my time. There's no reason why I should be, you know, over here with this crowd or over there with that crowd. I want to spend time alone. If I can't find anybody that likes the interests I do, I always got stuff that I can do alone. I can hunt alone. I can fish alone. You know, I can play my instruments alone. You know, all these habits that she helped me facilitate were all constructive. And I still am into all of them to, uh, at this very time, which has kind of helped me with med school too. You know, I get stressed out here and there. I say, you know, maybe I'll take the weekend off and go down uh, back home and do some hunting. If you want to get in trouble, it's because you chose to get in trouble. I like that. I like that. That's a, a no excuse mentality is take responsibility for yourself. Be accountable for your, your own decisions if you want to get in trouble. So did you have any um, siblings growing up? No, sir. Just myself. <laughs> and what, so, so then who are your who are your influences around your age? You know, friends or who, who are the ones that who are your influences around your age? And did any of them go into medicine or professional careers? Honestly, um, I was born into a kind of an older family. My parents had me late. So everybody was way older than me or way younger than me. So I didn't really have anybody within my own um, age range. So I kind of had to um, figure things out for myself in that aspect. But it was a blessing because, you know, I have, you know, my grandmother was X and my age. All my great grandmother was still alive. I knew all my great grandparents while they were still here. And so I chose to use them as like a source of knowledge. You know, it, you know, you can't find everything on the internet or between the pages of a book. So sometimes it requires you to go out and go seek, you know, these, this knowledge from people who are the elders in your family. So I'm, I am grateful for that. Um, I think I would prefer it that way than um, figuring it out from people who are around my age, you know, the, the resources and the stories that they have for you and the life that they've had is way more rich than somebody my age would have had at that time. That was real. Like I said, you can't learn everything from the books of the pages or the internet. I think back to when I was a, a younger child, right? There was no internet. So so we didn't, <laughs> we didn't even have the choice, right? You had to learn it from from the old, from the older older generations there. Um so school, what kind of what kind of student were you? Were you uh, a straight A kid from the get-go, BCs? What would I mean, I mean like let's say junior high and below, what kind of student were you early on? And and how much of it was your parents, you know, cracking that whip and saying you got to get good grades versus you just being kind of an introspective student who wanted to do well? 
Um, early on there, man, I was just really inquisitive about everything. I wanted to know how things work, where they came from, um, and how to do things myself. So, you know, early on, it was all, you know, um, self-driven. Um, I was a good student uh, early on. You know, uh, I went to Martin Luther King Elementary, shout out Martin Luther King. But, um, you know, that place was a great place to really develop. They had a um, program called um, GT, Gifted and Talented. And it was, you know. Let me, let, let me ask, was that a mostly white or black school? Um, it was about 50 50, actually. Um, it was yeah, MLK, cool. normally you think about it being, uh, you know, mostly African American. Yeah, and luckily it was down the street from my house, so it is still in a predominantly um, black area. But um, we actually had good representation for everybody, and uh, I think that was really important. For us. Did, did you have black teachers? Yes, absolutely. Did you have black black male teachers. Hmm. Me personally, no, but um, I know of um, some of my classmates that did. But the principal was a um, black man, Mr. Harris. I never forget him. He's uh, he was an excellent man. He did an excellent job um, with that school. Yeah, it's okay. We always wonder about the, you know, education as well. How much does having people who look like you, how, how much does that impact a child's will and desire to, to perform well? But I'm sorry, I interrupted you earlier on. So I'm sorry, go ahead. You're good. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it was all usually self-driven. Um, that GT program allowed you to uh, really apply yourself if you chose to, um, whether it was we're doing quiz balls or actually doing projects with each other. It really kind of showed you, you know, you're capable of more than what's just asked for you in a class. Nice, nice, nice. So that's that's good. So you got plugged in early. And that's, you know, that's cool, right? That helps out a lot when you're identified early as being somebody who is intelligent. I can't, I still can't figure this out. I'm trying to figure this little debate going on in my household. You know, my dad says that he remembers when I was a kid, they they took me, they were doing some testing because they wanted to they wanted to put me like remedial type of classes. Mm -hmm. I think my I, I gotta check. I think my mom says. No, it wasn't remedial classes. Like they were just testing me to see if I was gifted. I don't know. But all I, know is I remember when I was like probably in second grade, they would take me out of class and go, me and another individual and take us somewhere else and ask us questions and do stuff. And I always thought I was, I was like, oh, I'm killing it. I'm a smart kid. <laughs> but, then I, but then I get older. My dad was like, man, they were trying to see if you were remedial. I'm no. like, uh, and I think that's mostly because I still, you probably hear I talk really fast. I mumble. So part of it was probably because just the way I communicate with people. But um it's all good. So in terms of uh, maybe, let's say, going to junior high, high school, then you're a smart kid. What was it like around your your black friends? Was it was there any pressure about you being a smart kid or were they welcoming? How was that? How was that in your life? This is actually a really big topic I was looking forward to talking. On. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, <clears throat> so well, I'm glad I brought it up, too. <laughs> I, I was blessed to have, um, you know, the internal drive to really want to learn and the uh, ability to do so. Um, and I had a really good group of friends, no matter what type of background um, they were from. You know, my mother always taught me, you know, treat everybody the same and give everybody the same, you know, not, you know, everybody's you know, capable of doing anything that they want. Um, with that being said, um, they were supporting me all the way through. You know, it was almost like I made it to the NFL or the NBA or something. They were just like, yeah, you mean your friends. Yeah. And then even people that I may not, you know, speak to every day or even every year, you know, they still to this day will check in. And say, man, you're doing great. We're so proud of you. Keep pushing, you know. And you know, some of those backgrounds may not be, you know, as as clean and pristine as you would expect them to be, you know. But they're just happy that one of us, you know, was able to do what we're doing. But that uh, does bring me to my point. Um, that GT or the AP or the pre-AP uh, is a double-edged sword, you know, where it does get you ready for college and higher up education. It does uh, effect effectively segregate your schools. Um, you have people who are within that type of program who could not make the AP or AP, not because, you know, maybe they weren't capable, but because the school didn't think they were capable or, you know, maybe they had some type of disability that wasn't being addressed at the time um, or maybe they were unaware of. Um, and so you put them in what they call regular classes um, and, and that's damaging. You know, that's disrespectful to them, to their um, to their intellect. And then, you know, they get this so, idea that they're not as good as others. So are you saying like they start off in a GT and they get moved to a regular class? Is that what? Well, they, they, I'm saying they get um, automatically put into regular. You know, they don't get to choose between the AP and the pre-AP. They just get sent straight to regular. Oh. And, um, you know, math wasn't my strong subject. <laughs> I, I still don't like math. Uh, even here at Mexico, I don't like math. But, um, you know, I did one of the regular classes for math. I just, you know, it wasn't my thing. I wasn't really, you know, into the math. So I was like, you know, maybe I need to take it slow and kind of learn from the basics. And um, you know, one of the one of the uh, 
classes out and never forget is being in there and they don't really treat it like school. You know, they, they treat it almost as like it's, you know, alternative learning or like it's uh, like almost like a prison, man. And they, they don't really teach them. You know, they can do whatever they want in the class or around or messing around and no real teaching or learning is happening. And so after a certain while of people telling you you're not as smart as this person or this group of people, you start to internalize that. You know, and you could tell by the behavior that they're exhibiting back then. It's just like, no, you are just as capable as anybody. You just have to put the work in. Um, now, granted, we did have one teacher there who really took that job seriously. Now, his name was uh, Mr. Baker. And man, he made you feel like you were a genius. And, and the way he taught it make anybody learn. So, you know, I always used to say, you know, your ability to learn some of this material necessarily isn't always your ability. It may be your teacher failed to put it in a, a digestible form for you. It may not be that you don't understand it, but maybe you don't have somebody there that, you know, cares enough to make you and help you understand it and move forward. And that's where I saw, you know, the difference between the professors there, the ones who actually really care about your professional development and your future versus those, you know, are there to, you know, almost babysit a class. I remember I took summer school one year because not, I hadn't failed anything. I was a, I was a good student, I would say. Um, I was a good student probably through junior high and then high school, I became a very good student. Um, but I remember in high school, was it in high school? I think it was going into ninth grade year for whatever reason. I wanted to take a class early. So I took English early just so I wouldn't have to take it during the school year. And then my brother was in summer school and I just wanted to kind of hang out. And I had some friends who were going to summer school. So I went to summer school, took English that summer. And it, so I'm, I'm uh, incoming ninth grade and taking it with people who failed it, right? So these are people going to 10th grade. And man, they, there was no education in that class, zero education. We, I mean, we sat down there, the teacher would come in there, put on a movie and we'd just sit down there and just, just talk. Mm -hmm. I remember we watched white men can't jump. <laughs> we yeah. watched white men can't jump in our summer school English class and you know just goofing off doing whatever, man. I'm just thinking, man, this is is this what people's education is like? Mm -hmm. Um so you saying that right now, that was the only time I did a summer school course like that. But I can I can imagine exactly what you're talking about when sometimes you just kind of just look at kids and say almost almost a sense of like you guys are hopeless or something like that. We're, we're not gonna give you the attention you deserve. Um that was really unfortunate. So really unfortunate so what things were you into in high school like um other than academics you know so what was your social club like were you you know athletics you know was there like a fish and hunting group or whatever what what types of things did you do with your buddies and did you were you able to excel at those while excelling academically so um i was on the football team i was a linebacker well i started off as a tight end and then i didn't get along with the coach too well so i switched over to defense to kind of spite him um <laughs> i was a linebacker um and then i also wrestled i had a really successful first year second year i was kind of having trouble making weight because you know football wanted me heavier but my uh, wrestling wanted me lighter um other than that i did start out in the band i made all uh region jazz band my first year there um, Boy, this is high school so in high school you did band wrestling and football yes sir <laughs> wow yeah, I stayed. I always had my hands on something going on, but um, yeah, it was it was nice. I ended up having to drop band my uh, my second year just because of the athletic demands. Um, I was getting better at wrestling. I was getting better at football, so I figured you know I need to focus in. Um, I don't know if I regret that or if I appreciate that. Honestly, uh, I do miss the music side of me. Um, I realized that's something that I should have kept. But um, yeah, as far as hunting and fishing, not many people did except for you know a few. We go fishing on weekends, but that's about it. You know, we have this discussion in my house often about um, this idea, should you do, should kids do a lot of things, various things, or start narrowing down and when to narrow? I say, I used to be of the mindset that kids should do like a lot of stuff. Um, I used to be of that mindset. And when I say kids, I mean, I don't know what age range, but I would say my son, for example, you see his picture right there, he's 10, you know, he's um, eight, she's five, right? So these two younger ones are still doing a lot of stuff, like sports-wise, at least, right? Um, the 10-year-old, he decided he just wants to focus on basketball, so he just focuses on basketball. Um, I'm 5'10", so, so we'll, see. We'll, see how, we'll see how that goes, but he loves it. He's a killer at it, stuff like that. But I, I bring this up because, you know, to your point, you're saying, you, you always hear, like, athletes talking, talking about, that like, kids should do everything. It was, you know, like, I'm, people who are pro-athletes now. But the times have changed so much where it's not like it used to be, right? It's, it's really hard to be great at everything now. I think the reason the times have changed is because people are, there's so many trainers now, mm -hmm. right? So you have this hyper-focus at early ages and so many trainers. 
if you're not trading at something at an earlier age, it's really, really tough to compete when you get older. You know, we see it all the time now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in your case, you were probably, I don't know, you might be like maybe towards the latter age of that era where, were there a lot of like trainers in your generation doing stuff already or no? Um, so I did train with a program called D1. Um, I would train with them pretty much uh, year round. So it was really starting to really focus in on getting you in the gym, start lifting and working on your numbers pretty early there. And then uh, our coaches would go to Alabama and learn from their coaches and come back and bring it to us. Yeah, so it's, it's just fascinating thinking about this because, you know, I, I think about when people, kids are applying to med school and such and what, what it's going to look like. So, you know, my, my daughter, she's the only one who has an interest in medicine right now. The other kids don't have interest in medicine. My, my middle one says he wants to be a teacher. And he, of course he wants to play basketball, but I would say, what are you going to do after basketball to deal I have with all of them? They all need to try to own a business stuff. But I think about it, I'm like, what are kids' applications going to look like in 10 years? You know, um, I wonder if you're going to get more and more hyper-focused. I mean, applications to college, not, not med school. But, you know, they're going to get more hyper-focused, you know, as opposed to where I can say, I was part of this, 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 that. Like, you, you know, I wonder if kids are going to be like, hey, I just focus on this. I want to be great at this. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I don't know. I don't know. Do you have general thoughts? Uh, as far as the sports go, um, there was research out that says the earlier that you decide to um, – to focus on the sport, the uh, higher your injury risk ends up going. Um, we learned that um, in my uh, first degree at University of Arkansas. It was a kinesiology degree. And then um, I was actually a testament to that, man. Um, I started specializing more and more in football and my injuries went through the roof. And that's actually kind of what killed my, uh, my athletic career. Um, it was one major injury after the next, you know, uh, and it was happening on both sides of the body. You know, I can't, I can't account for that. So, but I can say the minute I stopped playing as many sports and started focusing directly on football is when those injuries start coming out. So I don't know, you know, the science behind that or why, um, why that is, but I do know that that's kind of what's going on. And I do know, you know, we do live in an era now where you're finding these, you know, basketball superstars that can do moves that the pros couldn't do, you know, 10 years ago at the age of like 14, 15 years old. You know, just because they're focusing on like, you know, where they might do one drill that works on lifting up your leg at this amount of degrees this many times for, you know, that much quicker of this first step, you know, and it's so very specific, you know, the trainers have finally got the science down to this and they know how to fix every single thing that may be wrong or right with uh, with your game. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough, man. It's, it's a challenge thing um, to figure that stuff out. So you just said kinesiology. So what led you down? What led you down that route to to major in kinesiology? Getting hurt all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, I say that's that's what's great about all this stuff, right? Let, letting your life experiences and the interest you get from life experiences help guide where you go in the future. So you're getting hurt all the time. Then you had this this bell clicked off and said, "Hey, I want to know why or what? What was the what was the thing?" So in middle school, I had this coach, um, and actually his name is uh, Coach Chavoris Zigway. And he ended up, you know, marrying me and my wife uh, this past uh, May. He just had that, um, you know, a, an impact on my life. Um, but he told me um, when he decided to stop playing basketball, he said, you know, I had this really big injury. You know, he was supposed to go um, past college. You know, I don't know if he's going to play pro overseas or pro over here. But um, he was really good. And you can still see, you know, he still got it. <laughs> but, um, you know, he told me, he was like, you know, am I doing this for me or is God trying to tell me, Hey, you know, you're going against the grain. I told you to stop. I have a bigger plan for your life than just sports right now. And so he decided to, you know, yield to that. And then, you know, after that, you know, it was very clear about what he was doing. So I did something kind of similar, you know, I was going to, um, I had a couple of schools that were interested for wrestling. Um, and I was thinking about walking on for football. Um, but then I kind of had to have a sit down with myself and say, you know, my body's pretty torn up pretty early on. You know, realistically speaking, the hits are going to get harder. People are going to get stronger. People are going to get faster. Um, and is my body even going to be able to withhold all that weight, all that strength, all that force, you know, at this age? And I had to be honest with myself and say, you know, it's probably not worth what it's given. And at that point, I think the CTE cases were starting to get noticed and everything. And I was like, you know, how about I switch my hustle from athletics and put the same amount of effort in, uh, into academics as I was putting into athletics? Mm. You know, and then that was a complete 180 for me that completely changed the trajectory, my trajectory in my life. Tim, what does that feel like? Did that feel like um, you're quitting? Did that feel like, cause you know, we get, we get, and I'll use myself as I only played through high school, but as an example, I remember like it was, that was my goal. I want to play. I want to play pro. I want to play pro. I want to play pro. And I got to the point where I had that realization that you hit. And then I had to ask myself, am I, cause people say, never give up on your dream. Never give up on your dream. Don't, no matter what happens, never give up. 
So what was that like for you when you've been working so hard, you had your trainers and all that stuff, and then you're saying, you know, I'm just not going to do it. Did, was there, was there a, a quitting sensation in that, or was it like, um, you know, I just matured? Uh, it was a little bit of bitterness, honestly. Um, I was mad for quite some time. I wouldn't even watch football um, through college. Uh, there would be some games, you know, I'd go to just because, you know, Razorbacks for us in Arkansas, we don't have any pro teams, so the Razorbacks are everything. So, you know, I would still go see the games, but, you know, in my heart, I was just watching. I was like, I feel like I could have done that better. I feel like I could have. You know, I'm bigger than him. I'm stronger than him. You know, if you play the same position, why could not? And then I had to really kind of start catching myself. It was like, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe there's something bigger. And then I start seeing how my friends who did play football, um, they were left with a huge gap in their life when sports ended. It's like, you know, you work your whole life to get to that peak. Even if you make it to the NFL, you know, you have a great career, you know, the career's only last so long. So now what do you do? And a lot of them became really tethered to the sport. There was no, you know, breaking that. It's, you know, okay, it's football for the rest of my life. If I'm done playing, I'm a coach. If I'm done coaching, I'll, you know, maybe do an anchor job for this. And it's just, I, I kind of wanted more for my life. I didn't want to get stuck in that cycle and just be stuck with athletics for the rest of my life. I love that, man. I, love, and I think that's something that kids, um, I, I don't know how, but that's the type of stuff that needs to be preached at, you know, for these kids whenever they're in these club organizations at such a young age. Um, I always use myself as an example my family because, like I said, he just loves basketball. So, you know, we're constantly preaching, like, hey, basketball's great. I'm not going to tell you you can't do it. You know, I'm going to – I coach. I'll, I'll do everything to help you get your goals. But it's going to end. <laughs> it is – I'm reading the book right now. It's called I Came as a Shadow by John Thompson. Um, and then with the section right now, he's talking about he would keep a deflated basketball in his office. He got it as a gift, but he kept this deflated basketball in his office to remind his, his players, like, at some point, the air is coming out of that ball. You're not going to bounce it. You're not going to be able to play anymore. So what do you what do you do there? So, I, I mean, I love what you're saying. I think that's something that the kids need to kind of think and understand more. Even more, I love what you did. I love how you took that passion and you moved it into kinesiology with it. So whenever you, whenever you decided to go to kinesiology, were you, did you know you were going to go into medicine already? Well, tell me about that. Yeah, when did no. you decide you wanted to go into medicine? The end goal was always medicine, um, but it had nothing to do with athletics, to be honest. Um, uh, because I was born into an older family, um, it actually gives you older you know, family members. So um, with that comes a lot of disease, with that comes a lot of, you know, unhealthiness that may be within your family. So I was always in and out of the hospital, you know, from one person to the next, losing one person to the next. And then again, that, you know, drill in my head, I could do that. I see how they make them feel, they made us feel. You know, you never forget, you know, you'll forget what people say to you, but you don't forget how people make you feel. And that was probably the biggest stamp for why I wanted to go into medical school is because I kept losing family member after family member after family member. It was almost like they were being used as like test mice, you know? There wasn't, you could tell this wasn't quality health care that they were giving. You know, they weren't treating them like human beings. They come in, stare at the chart for the whole time, and would never look up to actually speak to the person they were talking to. And so, you know, I felt that, man, if I could just have enough time for the family that I do have left, I can go be a physician. I can learn about all this. I can save the rest of my family. You know, and so that was kind of where my journey for medicine began. But as far as kinesiology, um, I do love sports. At the end of the day, I love sports. Absolutely. So let me ask you, so how old were you when you said that that's when the journey began? How old were you when you were thinking these things and said, man, medicine's going to be it? Was it younger or was it like high school? Or It was young, man. It would have probably been around like 12 to 15-ish. Something like that. You were a kid. Somewhere between there, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, then kinesiology, yeah, how did kinesiology then impact everything? Um, initially, I thought, you know, maybe I'll just be an athletic trainer. You know, work close to the athletes. I still want to work really close to the athlete. Um, but then I started realizing, I was just like, you know, I do want to still live comfortably and I still want to be, you know, I've always been within uh, leadership positions. And so I kind of want to maintain that leadership position. And I feel like I wasn't able to necessarily facilitate that through that career, me personally. Um, and so I wanted more. So initially I started uh, looking at PA school. I was like, you know, uh, I've never seen a, at that time. I've never seen a black doctor. I was like, you know, this other races, you know, they, they are usually the ones who hold the doctor positions. I can't do that. I'm not smart enough to do that. You know, I don't want to do another four years after, after uh, undergrad. Hey, I want, I, so I want you to say that again. So you said you had never seen a black doctor. How old were you? Uh, at that time, I was um, probably 18. And I was getting ready to go to college. So I had to choose a major and everything. I was like, yeah, I've never seen so that. I, then how old were you the first time you saw a black doctor? I would say ooh, probably 20. Probably 20. Gracious. Well, okay. That's really bad, man. It's just, you just didn't, in my, from where I'm from, you just didn't think they exist. And so it kind of takes that career option off the table for you. Oh, well, at least I know I'm not doing med school, you know, too many years after undergrad anyway. And then, um, you know, it's probably not smart enough for it. 
Um, lo and behold, who would have known I would have done two degrees in between <laughs> on uh, the undergrad just to get to med school. If you would have told me I would have done this much school in my life, I would have told you you were lying. There's absolutely no way I would have agreed to this when I was younger. But um, when you love what you're doing, you're willing to do anything for it. I love it. When you love what you're doing, you're willing to do anything for it. I love it. Love it. Um, so kinesiology in college. How, what kind of college student were you? Were you focused? Were you locked in? Grades good? A struggle? Like, was everything... Were you moving towards that path that you thought you thought you'd be moving towards? Did you have struggles? Um, luckily enough, uh, my wife and I got together before um, college. We were in high school. We were high school sweethearts. Oh, nice. She was the studier. I was just the look at it once and go take the test. Mm -hmm. And so she taught me how to actually study. So having that partner, you know, initially going to college, I'm like, man, I'm scared. I might fail. I just big leagues. You know, how do I study? I don't know how to study. And I've been wasting my whole life. I don't know how to study. <laughs> like and. She kind of set me down and taught me the basics and um, she really was my backbone for that. Um, so with her help, you know, being able to study and understand things or she'd be good at one thing, I'd be good at another and we complement each other. Um, my grades were really good in college. Um, I got a lot of scholarships, um, got a lot of rewards for it. Um, and I, I was really able to apply myself. I did pledge Omega Sci-Fi and so I was the president there for I think about two or three years as well as the undergraduate representative for the ninth district um, as well. So did that, when you pledged, how was that? A, was that a, did that semester see any sort of dip in your grades or were you, you just still held, held, held steady? It was uh, actually my second highest GPA of college. Hmm. So, you know, a lot of people say they see their, uh, the grades dip. I think it's, uh, it's about time management. It taught me it, it, great time management, you know, um, you know, I have to learn um, my schoolwork, you know, I'm here for school, I'm here for school, I'm here for school. You know, and I had to keep reminding myself at the end of the day, you know, Omega Sci-Fi, it is forever, but um, that's not why I'm here. I love it. I love that. That's a good point, right? People talk about, a, hey, and I'm not going to lie, I, I never pledged, but I thought about pledging a couple of mm -hmm. times. And I was thinking I was so focused on getting those grades. I was like, man, because it's going to mess up my grades. But, you know, that's a good point, right? It's, it's, a, it's a higher challenge sometimes, right? It's a challenging yourself to see, hey, let me, let me get this time management thing, right? Let me lock in. Let, let me make this thing happen. Um, so did well academically, MCAT, MCAT, how was that for you? Ooh, that was the biggest uh, barrier of my life, man. I hated MCAT. I hated everything about it. I hated sitting down studying for it. I hated getting questions wrong. I hated the practice exams, but it was, uh, it was a necessary process. Um, I did end up taking it three times before I got the score I needed to let me in. Um, but I also, like, you know, I knew more than what was on that test. I would just never get a high yield test. Every test I got, I was like, man, you know, none of the stuff that they say was high yield is on here. I'm on these questions. Where's the high yield stuff? <laughs> so I don't know. I feel like I never got a representative MCAT too, so that might have played into it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I, I hated MCAT too. I was, was not a fan of my MCAT score. I didn't do well by any means um, on the MCAT. Um, it was okay because I did well in, my, in the med school on the board test. So that's something I always tell pre-meds. I'm like, you know, don't let that MCAT score kind of, and even for you, you're saying, don't let that MCAT score make you think you can't, you're not going to do well on the steps. I did, I did pretty doggone good on the step test, right? But my MCAT would not have told you that was going to happen. Exactly. Um, so now the decision for med schools and the application process, what was the actual application? I'm sure you would have done virtual interviews since the whole COVID stuff. But tell me, what was the application process like for you going to med school? I know we're skipping over, you know, some other degrees, but you know, go to med school. What was that? What was that like for you? Was it stressful trying to decide where to apply, and then ultimately, what what happened that you, that you landed at Meharry? So um, the med school process itself is very mystic. Uh, there's a lot of things you don't know that's required for that process um, unless you know somebody who's done the process. Um, and for a lot of minorities that I know, um, it's not readily available to find that information. That's where we come in. Um, so, you know, I didn't even know I had to have a letter from my own school <laughs> in um, support of my application. And that whole process, you know, I have to submit almost everything I have to submit for um, the actual med school application, I had to submit to them. And did, you have a, stuff. did you have a pre-med advisor mm -hmm. in college? Uh, not a direct advisor. Um, my advisor um, just so happened to be on the pre-med advisory committee, luckily enough. Mm -hmm. Um, but I never had any issues. He always believed in me from the job. And uh, he was really, like, really positive. The whole way. I didn't have your typical, you know, your grades are not high enough. Your MCAT's not high enough. He was like, you know, you never know what can happen. All you need is one yes. And so, but, yeah. so why didn't you know the things you needed to know to apply? Um, that's the thing. I didn't, um, I don't think he actually was, like, the head of the program to where he knew everything that you need to do. He was just assessed like your interview, if that makes sense. Okay. He wasn't actually like cumulating, oh, you need to get this done, make sure you get that done. 
Um, but I also feel like, you know, without the people that I was talking to, uh, we have a group called Medicues and that's um, pretty much every um, medical professional, doctors and dentists in the world is in one group message. And so I really utilize that. Um, and those personal interactions tell me, okay, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. This is by this time, this is how this works. If you get it in by this time, you'll probably hear by that time. And they explained to me you know, how the rolling admissions work and everything, but um, it is a lot of moving parts. And there's a lot of things you have to personally make sure that you've done correctly and, um, and have perfected, uh, including like your personal statements and everything, having enough people read through it, not just one, not just two. Um, so it was a lot. And it was very, 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 I mean, put this very emphasis on this. It is very expensive. <laughs> Yeah, very expensive. And that I did not know that. And I had to open up several credit cards and was in debt for quite some time trying to make sure I could pay, you know, for my journey to go there between MCAT, MCAT prep, traveling. Uh, my first round actually uh, was before COVID. So I did have to travel for an interview or two. Um, you know, suits, ties, getting your hair cut before interviews. Um, and then the actual application itself. Uh, my first time I sent out around 22 different schools. Why net? You know, I wanted to see, you know, who was going to pick up on it. So it is very expensive. Yeah, man. So pre-meds, any pre-meds listen to this thing, budget early. Like freshman year, start thinking about it. If you can, like literally, no joke, literally your freshman year, start saving up for applications if you know you're going to go down this route. So you mentioned cut your hair, man. You got a lot of hair there. You got you got, got a lot of hair. Yeah. Um, and I know that's something that's important to you, right, about being yourself. Tell me, tell me about that. Because I remember when I was in um, maybe second year med school, one of the deans where somebody came up on stage and they were like, by the time I didn't, I had low hair then, now I got no hair, but I had low hair there. And my buddy had the big, you know, whatever twist dress, whatever he had. And Dean was like, by the time you all graduate, you're, you're, you're all y'all gonna have low hair, right? Um, my buddy was like, nah, man, I'm never gonna do that. He's got a tat on his back in high school, he got a tat across his back that says doing it my way. So it's always been really big on being an individual. Um, but by the time we graduated, his hair was low. But I don't think he did it out of pressure. He just, he just wanted a haircut. But just to the point that there's a sense of um, people conforming a lot to a certain look and what a doctor should look like. But I know for you, it's important. Um, so tell me tell me about that. Yeah, so um, that kind of feeds into um, what I was talking about earlier where, you know, I've never seen a Black doctor. And in America, they have their eyes. Once I did, you know, start seeing Black doctors, I started noticing the trend, you know, low cut, you know, they all kind of act, talk, uh, move the same. I was like, you know, why can't we be ourselves? And at the end of the day, you know, people um, get wrapped up in the fact that it's still just a job. You know, it's still a job. Now, it is a very pristine job. It's a very professional job. You're in charge of people's lives, but it's still just a job. Outside of that, you should be comfortable with who you are as a person. So um, my mother had locks growing up, you know, way down here, real long locks. And that was what I associated with Black beauty when I was young. You know, your mother is everything to you. So if your mom's got it, you know, it's beautiful. And it was. Um, but I always wanted to grow up, you know, I couldn't get it before um, in college because I knew I was going to be bald at some point. <laughs> so um, besides that, I started growing them up. Uh, after I finished that up, I was like, you know, it's my time to actually do what I want with this. And I've committed to keeping them um, through pretty much my entire career um, because I want other people to look at me and say, wow, he's free being himself with his locks. As you can see, I can be free being my locks with my locks. You know, I can um, still be this huge professional, you know, within my own, um, within my own way and still be me, you know, and that includes, you know, with the tattoos and I granted I don't have any tattoos on my face and neck and, you know, hands, but um, I feel like it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to be us. You know, we can do it our way too. We don't have to conform and do it anybody else's way. And as long as you're professional, as long as you're, you're not breaking any rules, any laws, as long as you're genuinely doing and providing a great service, it's okay to be yourself. Yeah, I mean, the, idea, the whole idea is you want a doctor's going to excel at their craft, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I just, I don't care what you look like. I want you to know what you're doing when you cut me open or whenever you're intubating me or whatever, right? You want somebody to excel at their their craft. You know, I would I would join you in the, in the hair game, but man, <laughs> unless you want to donate some of that hair to me, man, mine's long gone, long gone. Um, I love it. I love it. I love it. So, you know, you're early in your med school career. I'm just a couple more questions. I'll let you get out of here. Early in your med school career, what has been the biggest kind of surprise for you so far um, in med school or maybe the, the biggest challenge or the biggest um, blessing or whatever, you know, what, what has been the kind of the biggest thing for you? Um, the biggest surprise for me is that you can do it. It's manageable. You know, they make med school out to be this big monster and it's, you know, like drinking, water uh, from a fire hydrant, you know, it's almost impossible. Well, 
you know, how do you drink water from a fire hydrant? One cup at a time, you know, one little bit at a time, you know, and as long as you're good at managing your time, knowing what it is you're responsible for learning that day and making sure that you get after it, then it's doable. And then also giving yourself time to relax. You know, that's just as important as, as much as you grind as we put in is about the time that you can unwind and actually give yourself your brain a rest. You'd be surprised, you know, what you retain in the morning if you, you know, if you, when, you, when you feel tired, your body tells you to stop, actually stop, you know? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Love it. Um, so it's just a, uh, a fun question that I actually got this from. I listened to Baron Davis podcast and I got this from Baron Davis. So I've been using it. But I love the question. So if you could be any artist or not, if you could be an artist, which artist do you feel like you most relate to? It could be a painter, it could be a musician, um, you know, whatever type of art out there, right? A dancer or even an athlete. You know, I think athletics is a type of art in a sense. What artist would you say you most relate to and why? It's always going to be Lil Wayne, man. <laughs> it's always going to be Lil Wayne. Um, just because he's my favorite artist, um, but also I grew up on him and I like his his grit. I like his mentality, you know. Um, I don't feel like I'm um, trying to step on anybody, but I want to be the best. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to be the best. You know, if I'm doing this, I'm doing this till I die. You know, I'm not going to forever be in the studio till I die. I'm going to take what you did and make it better in my own way until I die. And that's just kind of the mentality that he's taking. Um, just challenging yourself every day and really owning your craft, really locking in and making sure that you are the best at what you're doing. Personally, your personal best at what you're doing. And that kind of bleeds over to like, you know, I feel like him and Kobe Bryant were related in, within that sense as well. And, you know, they would always compliment one another back and forth between different, um, different platforms, but he kind of had that mentality as well. And so that's why I always look for the one. It's just, you know, there's nobody in my opinion that's better has ever come any close to him. And I respect him for that. And I, I aspire to be like that um, within my profession. You got a favorite um, bar from Wayne? A bar from Wayne. Uh, let me see. No cuss. Probably, no probably not shareable uh, appropriately, <laughs> honestly, uh, knowing his music. But um, anything from that No Ceilings mixtape, man. Anything from that No Ceilings mixtape. That's hard to, uh, it's hard to miss down. Or Carter Three. That was my favorite album from Carter Three. Um, and think about when, so I don't, I don't like, I don't like pride, right? Because my faith, you know, I'm of Christian faith and, and it's very big on like, don't be proud, proud, whatever. So I don't mm -hmm. like pride, but I like, I like his confidence. You know, he's some of the greatest rapper alive, some of the greatest rapper at Like he, he wasn't, he wasn't ashamed to say, I think I'm the greatest. Like, you know, like if you, if you don't believe me, you know, let's, let's go at it, let's battle, let's, let's figure it out there. But that, that type of, um, again, I'm, I, I don't want to call it, I won't call him being proud. Maybe he was I don't know, but I, I took it as he he was just confident in, in his craft. He worked so hard at it that he was just confident, and you weren't gonna tell him nothing, right? This kind of like kind of like I call it, you said when I said Yeezy first, I meant Weezy. I was like kind of like Kanye. People yeah. might say he's crazy, but Kanye is confident in what he can do, right? And nobody's gonna challenge him. And Wayne, you know, I say Wayne was not to the extreme of Kanye, but Wayne had that mentality, you know, pre Kanye, right? Mm -hmm. So I definitely, definitely understand that where you're going from there. Um, and then I'm going to give you the last word, but I always say I wanted to end, you know, whatever you want to tell people, but I do want it to end with my name is Dr. Or I guess student Dr. Um, no Thomas. And I am a black man in the white coat. I got to hear those words, man, because uh, the, the, the people, the people got to hear that part. My name is student Dr. Noah Thomas. I am a black man in the white coat. I want everybody out there to know that it is possible for you to do this as well, no matter what you look like, no matter where you're from, no matter if your hair is long, if you have tattoos down your arm, because I do too. It's okay to be yourself and it's okay to be professional. It's okay to excel in your craft. At the end of the day, it's still just a job. Excellent. And give them your social media handles. Uh, at Q-U-E underscore Chapo, C-H-A-P-O. will find me on um, Instagram. Um, Twitter, I think it's M E D I Q A L two. Have to double check that. I'm not on Twitter. That means you don't use your Twitter. <laughs> yeah, have to double check them. But um, yeah, you guys follow me. You guys have any questions? I'm open to uh, talking to anybody that's um, on the same journey. Anybody that needs help, questions, um, you know, feel free. I feel like I'm an open book, and I'll give it to you um, on the honest and real version, not the uh, the sugar coated version. I'll give it to you, bro. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. To the fans, listeners, love you guys, man. Thanks for supporting. Make sure you click that subscribe button, follow, like, share, all that good stuff to help us uh, feel like y'all love what we're doing, man. See you next, see you next time. Ain't no time for stressing. I've been really stepping. Ooh, ooh.